words that simply say, you are an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. I'm just wondering if you might know the first verse of this hymn, that we could sing it together. Let me go over the words, immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light, inaccessible, hid from our eyes. Most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. My Part of my talk yesterday was about thinking magnificently of God. Thinking magnificently of God. This hymn helps us. We'll just try the first verse and see how it goes. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes. Most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, I make name we praise. Unresting, unhasting, and silent as light, nor wanting, nor wasting, thou rulest in might. Thy justice, like mountains, high soaring above, thy clouds, which are fountains of goodness and love. To all life thou givest, to both great and small, in all life thou livest. You almost want to stop and soak that up, you know. In all life God lives. This is about his kingdom, which is our theme for this session. In all life thou livest, the true life of all. We blossom and flourish as leaves on the tree and wither and perish, but not changeth thee. Shall we try that last one? Those of you who are nearer can help me out and great father of glory pure father of light thine angels adore thee all veiling their sight all praise we should render oh help us to see tis only the splendor of light hideth thee. And now, Almighty Lord, we ask that you would help us this morning and that you would quicken our minds and our spirits to hear what we need to hear as we think of the gospel of your son Jesus and how he came into the world and gave himself to us to bring us into your kingdom. And so we dwell on that thought and we anticipate great gifts this day in the honor of Jesus, we say these things and wait before you. Amen. It's a wonderful story about Dorothy Day. Dorothy Day was a great saint, Catholic, who lived in the last century, died not too long ago. And a while before her death, Robert Coles, whom you may know, visited her one last time, and she said, it will soon be over, and added, I try to think back. 
I try to remember this life that the Lord gave me. The other day I wrote down the words, A Life Remembered. I thought it would be a title. And I was going to try to make a summary for myself. Write what mattered most, but I could not do it. I just sat there and thought of our Lord and his visit to us all those centuries ago. And I said to myself that my great luck was to have had him on my mind for so long in my life. Now, we want to do a little bit of a summary, but we have a lot to cover in this hour. Um, so I'm going to hope not to be too distracted. And we will have a good long question uh, session, as Gary mentioned. So how are we to look at what we're doing here? I want to say that the real issue to Christ is obedience to Christ. This is what is omitted in so much that is called spiritual formation today. Um, spiritual formation is not about spiritual formation. And when you get involved in it, that's one of the things you really have to remember or you'll just wind up doing some weird things. Um, it's not about spiritual formation. It is about inward transformation into Christ-likeness. Right. And uh, that's what we're after. And this is what, among other things, keeps us out of legalism and bondage to practices and comparisons of ourselves with others uh, on how we are doing the things that go into spiritual formation. And, uh, and that's too bad because, you see, spiritual formation essentially involves practices. Spiritual disciplines, which we'll talk about more later, are essential to spiritual formation as a process. Because character is not changed by talk. It's a, a strange but important thing to know. Character is changed by action. And, of course, change of character then changes action. But it's what we do that begins to shift who we are inside. Now, as I... I have said, spiritual formation without regard to any specifically religious practice is the process by which the human spirit or will is given a definite form. The word form in formation. You're getting a definite form. You take on a character. And it's very important to understand that everyone gets a spiritual formation. Everyone we deal with and ourselves, they are uh, expressing in their lives the spiritual formation that they've had. Whether it's a uh, president or a government official or a businessman or a surgeon or a bag lady or a bag gentleman, um, they've all had character formation. It's like education. Everyone gets an education, just a question of which one. You don't have to go to school to get an education. You're going to get one wherever you are, right? I was reading Elaine's little biographical statement. I think you all have it. And she was talking about her education and why she had made a certain turn. And she said, 
the education I was thinking about did not answer the one question, and that is how to live. Did I get that right? Yep, how to live. And that's where we are today. And uh, now spiritual formation for the Christian is um, basically the spirit-driven process. Spiritual formation has two main, the spiritual in spiritual formation has two main connotations. One is it is something that is accomplished by the Holy Spirit. Now, you have to be engaged. It won't do it for you. But as you act, then the Holy Spirit acts with you and in you. And your thoughts become different, your feelings become different, your body behaves differently, your soul begins to work the way it's supposed to. And uh, the second connotation is it is formation of your spirit. And that's your will, and your will solidifies into character and then your character gets farmed out to your body and your social context. Now we have to break that down this afternoon. I think we're getting into that. Uh, spiritual formation is primary, primarily the formation of the will, but you have to understand that the will solidifies into character. Character is basically what you do without thinking. But it also expresses itself in what you do after you think. So we have to keep both levels in mind. But the idea is to get you where you just do the things that Jesus would do and said because of who you now are. That's who you are. It's your identity. Now we're back to identity. And then power comes with that through your life in the kingdom. The kingdom is not in word, as Paul said to the Corinthians, but in power. It's not just words, it's power. So spiritual formation for the Christian refers to the spirit-driven process of forming the inner world of the human self in such a way that it becomes like the inner world of Christ himself. And that happens in the status of disciple. Spiritual formation in Christ is what comes from the process. And then just a little more here in the way of summary. Um, and uh, we get to dwell on this a little more in the second hour this morning. You are the light of the world. See? That we get to be that. Because that's what God appointed us for. You remember what I said about why they didn't why Adam and Eve didn't know they were naked, right? Because they glowed. And actually I've watched people glow in Christ. I remember, man, I, I started preaching in jailhouses and streets, and I re still remember a man uh, in the what they call the workhouse in uh, Tennessee, Cleveland, Tennessee, how as I came week after week to preach, he started, his face became different. Okay. Now, I think light primarily refers to Truth, love, and power. So I think that's what, it isn't just our faces glow. We might go to a good cosmetician and get some help with that. But it's primarily truth, love, and power. That's the light. Now you are the light of the world. And the outcome of spiritual formation is expressed by Paul here in the letter to the Philippians. 
after the wonderful passage, the great kenosis passage where it talks about how he emptied himself and came among men in human form um, and went to the very depths of human degradation by a death on the cross. One of the things about the death on the cross, it was, it was a terrible, terrible thing. Um, they cut Paul's head off because he was a Roman citizen and you couldn't crucify a Roman citizen. Right? And uh, it was a terrible way to die. And uh, he came all that way down. And now uh, Paul says to the Philippians, um, work out your salvation. Not work to it. Don't work to your salvation. Work it out. Uh, your salvation is incorporation into the life of God. That's your salvation. And you get it, and now then you work it out with fear and trembling. Now, <laughs> those words are actually familiar words in the Bible to characterize a quality of of respect and awe. You know, the Proverbs tell us that the uh, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It doesn't say it's the end, but it's the beginning. The beginning of wisdom. And sometimes uh, people have a hard time thinking about that. You mean I'm supposed to spend my days cowering in a corner? No. No. Think about it this way. Do you all fear gravity? I've got some yeses and I've got some noes. <laughs> kind of depends on where you're standing, doesn't it? <laughs> In some places, I fear gravity with trembling. Right? And actually, if you're just walking down the steps here, you fear gravity, you respect gravity. You wouldn't necessarily want to see it disappear, would you? Because you'd disappear too. <laughs> Psst. Something like that. No, that, that wouldn't even be that, would it? Because that's the effect of gravity is another sense. So you fear the Lord in terms of what he is and his greatness. You respect that. And uh, what the proverb is saying is you begin to get smart <laughs> at the point where you recognize you're dealing with God. That's when you begin to get smart. And you can go on from there. And do all things without grumbling or disputing. Wow, we've already changed the world, haven't we? that you may become blameless and innocent, children of God, above the reproach in the midst of a twisted and misdirected generation, among whom you shine as stars in the world. Now that's the outcome of the process that we are talking about here. Um, and it doesn't take any special financing or education, it just keep company with Christ and learn from him. Now, that has been the substance of Christian teaching through the ages, and you see people that we know uh, walked into this, we have great names, uh, that stand out um, in uh, the ancient church. Uh, people um, who gave their lives and became absorbed in the kingdom. 
and uh, Anthony of Egypt, for example, deserted everything to follow Christ, went into the desert, lived a life of solitude and prayer. There were tremendous experiences he had with God and some things not so good. And before long, the rulers of the country were coming, trekking out into the desert to talk to Anthony. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Well, that's because he realized this thing about being the light of the world. He didn't, he didn't intend to do that. He didn't do it in order to get important people to come and talk to him. But the world is desperate for knowledge and reality. And uh, there are so many ways in which that is expressed. But one of the things that has happened in our time is that the teachings of Christ um, that has been inherited through his people down through the ages in many parts of the world have been displaced out of the domain of knowledge. And today it's very hard to get people to understand this because it's now become a part of the air they, bleed, they breathe. And so when uh, the government wants to work with some religious organizations, they call them people of faith, right? They don't call them people of knowledge. You notice that? See, that's just a symptom of the displacement that has occurred. And uh, the church has very largely cooperated with that because of their misunderstanding of faith. And they have given up knowledge. Now, I don't have a lot of time in these sessions to work with you on this, but I challenge you to take your concordance and follow knowledge and you will find that knowledge is the fundamental gift that comes to us from Christ, it's knowledge. And um, there are so many verses, uh, I just mentioned, take Second Peter, first chapter, and watch in the first 11 verses the role that knowledge plays. And you will see that this is simply a disaster. It is a social calamity because it has destroyed the standing of Christian teachers in contemporary society and nothing is more important today than the recovery of the church as the unique purveyor of essential knowledge in response to the four great questions of life. You remember what those are. Now, a part of the problem is that now no one thinks there is any knowledge at all. About the uh, uh, questions. They just think every, everyone is irrational and they make a great leap. And uh, then when they've done that, uh, they try to live in the leap. And this makes for a society that is irrational and lives by power. Right. So now our task is to try to do something to restore this, and this is why there is such a thing as the Renovari Institute. The Renovari Institute is designed to help people restore knowledge to the great questions. And that's why you have assignments and exercises and you have to write and all that sort of thing. It's almost like School, isn't it? Right? It is. That's what it is. And that's the way it should be. So now this kind of summarizes and helps us 
keep before us what we're doing. And uh, we have competition. The three stories that are generally available uh, to people in our culture, the theistic story, that's basically the one that Christianity brings. And that's still the framework of our society and our culture. It's just that, for the most part, it isn't presented as knowledge, but as tradition. Then competing with that, you have a scientific story, the idea that it's the sciences alone that bring knowledge, and then the sciences do not deal with the great questions, except sort of behind their back. And uh, still, uh, you go on the university campuses, and you'll find that there's a kind of background assumption that what is to be known is known in the sciences. And part where that comes out is basically a materialist theory of you and of reality. And then you have the nirvana story, as I call it. Sometimes we call it new age. It's actually the oldest age story uh, on human record. So uh, now just notice that each of these questions, these stories, has a response to who is well off or blessed. It has a response to who is, genuinely, uh, who is a genuinely good person. Often that reduces to nothing less than just tolerance, as it's understood in that system. And then how does one become a genuinely good person? Well, you know, we pick that up mainly from our poets and our song leaders. For example, if you listen uh, to John Lennon's songs, take Imagine, for example, uh, you'll be told how to become a good person, namely, follow John and believe what he believes. Okay, now that's, that's the summary. And we have to keep the continuity. And today, in this session, we're spending our time talking about the kingdom of God. In your notes, you have lecture four, what is the kingdom of God and how do I live there? Well, this is actually more on what it is than on how I live there, but that is, that is what we do later on in the day, is talk about how we live there. Okay, so now if you have questions about that, please keep them before your mind, and we will get back to them shortly. All right, what is the kingdom of God? You have on your sheet, what is the kingdom? A government, one who... Every person has a government. It isn't just God, uh, but God's kingdom is the place where we flourish as human beings. And your kingdom is an illustration of a kingdom. And actually, one of the best ways of coming to understand what a kingdom uh, is, is to think about your kingdom. Now, you're given a kingdom by your creation. And that's where Genesis 1.26, which is on your sheet, um, ties in. Tell me now, what is the image of God in human beings? Which? Dominion. Having dominion. What is that? That's kingdom. Or if you like queendom, you can do that. Or personedom. Um, so you're made for kingdom. Right? And uh, God's kingdom is where your kingdom flourishes. So let's just get some wording here on what the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God is God reigning 
It is the range of God's effective will. It's the range of God's effective will. It's where what God wants done is done. Okay. So that's its basic nature. It is not political in its basic nature. It has tremendous implications for the political and the social, but it comes simply from the nature of God. You go into a Greek Orthodox church and look up in the dome and you'll see Christ looking down. And you may see the words cosmocrater, ruler of the cosmos. That's Jesus. That's God. The kingdom of God is the range of God's effective will. Now, nearly everything automatically falls under that except most prominently for us human beings. Human beings have the option of living in the range of God or not. And we've chosen not to. There is a, an instigator of that because um, apparently this issue of who's the ruler predates us. And uh, so now uh, some angelic beings decided not to be ruled by God. And um, that was an unhappy choice for them. Uh, but they're still trying to do that. And the main way in which they do that is by influencing human beings. This, this, asks, this makes us ask the question, what is supposed to come out of human history. Human history is a very short period of time, uh, cosmologically very short, compared to dinosaurs and cockroaches, very short indeed. We have a little time here, maybe 40,000 years, in which there has been a, an, a, an earth where it was possible for human beings to develop and inhabit and create a story and it makes you wonder why there should be such a thing. We live in a cosmic shooting gallery. It is in itself a miracle that human history has lasted this long. And uh, we live uh, at the mercy of the rocks that are flying around, if that's all there is to it. And you wonder, well, it must be that God has something special in mind for human history. What is supposed to come out of human history? I, I'm, I'm not going to try to dwell on that question long, but just want to get it before you. What's supposed to come out of human history? And something very special, no doubt, that might have to do with people. So uh, this idea now is God has a kingdom. Uh, he is working in that kingdom. He has made a place in that kingdom for human beings and human history. And he wants to bring something out of that for his purposes, no doubt, for eternity or in the long run. So now his kingdom comes back into the world and our kingdom is there running amok and you might judge that just from looking around you, perhaps looking in your own life, and you see how my kingdom has not been integrated in God's kingdom. So when Jesus comes, what's his message? Repent, for the kingdom of the heavens is at hand. Okay, now we have to stay there a while. Matthew 3 when John the Baptist comes, what is his message? Repent, for the kingdom of the heavens is at hand. When Jesus moves into his ministry, Matthew 4, 17, same message. Repent, for the kingdom of the heavens is at hand. And then that is picked up by Jesus and developed 
And this afternoon, or the next session, we're going to talk about the Sermon on the Mount, as we call it, because it is a proclamation of kingdom. That's what it is. And we'll see how that works. But the important thing to see just for the gospel is that it runs all the way through the New Testament. See, the message of the kingdom. And that is two things. You have a kingdom. God has a kingdom. Satan has a kingdom. Lots of kingdoms buzzing about. And when you see things internationally or in families or communities where there's a big uh, confrontation or confrontation of big trouble, it's always kingdoms clashing. Right? So the little child comes in and it has a kingdom. Pretty, qu pretty quick. It has a kingdom. And what is his kingdom? It's the things that are under the range of its will. See, the key to kingdom is will. What is under the range of my effective will? Where what I want done is done. See, that's the source of human problems, and that comes out of not thinking rightly about God. And so the message is very naturally repent. Now, repent, uh, every one of those words in that message get distorted so you can't get it. You have to go back and look at what was happening around Jesus to see what it meant. Repent uh, is a word, uh, metanoeti. It's an imperative form, and it means basically think about your thinking. Think about your thinking, because your thinking is what has ruined you, and it's what makes you uh, impact the lives of others and so on. And uh, you look at the great uh, misleaders, you know, many, many of the people we call leaders, we should call them misleaders because that's what they're doing. Well, Hitler was a great misleader. What was his problem? His thinking. His thinking. And then you go back and look at what he said, and you say, this is terribly wrong thinking. See, so you have to think about your thinking. Meta noeti. Now, when you think about your thinking, you may break out in fits or pound your forehead on the floor or something like that. And that is often an appropriate response when we discover what our thinking has been like. <laughs> but that's not a part of it, because many times the people who repent most effectively and stronger are people who are quite calm. And they just simply see this is wrong, and they walk off from it. You'll find people who quit cocaine cold turkey that way. They just walk off. They suffer and all of that, but they've accepted that. That's repentance. And that repentance comes out of a vision. And the vision is life in the kingdom of God, not in my kingdom. I offload my kingdom. Now, it's God's kingdom, and my kingdom is effective in God's kingdom. Now, that's how it was meant to work. We were meant to live in the influence and presence of God because uh, it is a personal presence. It isn't just a, a, a law like the force be with you or something of that sort, you know. It's a person. We live, a kingdom is a personal thing. A queendom is a personal thing. There's so many things that come out of that. For example, kingdoms work by words. And so you see Jesus working by speaking. How was the world created? By speaking. 
See, that's how kingdoms work. It's a personal interaction, and we speak. That's why there's such a thing as prayer. See, prayer is baffles many people. They can't understand. Why would there be an arrangement like that? Well, it's kingdom stuff, and kingdoms work by speaking. Hmm. So Jesus comes and he announces the kingdom and then what does he teach about all the time? The kingdom. What's it like? Well, the kingdom of heaven is like uh, leaven. <laughs> That's a good one. It teaches you something about the kingdom. The kingdom works like leaven. Yeast or, you know. You put a little bit of yeast in a bunch of dough and pretty soon... It's all over the place, right? How did we get, well, you didn't see anything happening. It just, that way, see? That's the kingdom. That's how the kingdom works. The kingdom of heaven is like a seed, like a mustard seed. Put a little bitty seed. Put it in the dirt. Grows up, becomes a large plant. And birds come and rest on its branches. Right? What's the kingdom of heaven like? Well, it's like um, there's a man who had some work and he went out into the marketplace and found people waiting for jobs. And so he said, come work in my vineyard and I'll pay you a day's wages. And he came back after coffee and there's some more people there. And he said, hey, come on. It went on until just one hour was left. He had had a nap and a cookie. <laughs> right? Now he comes out again. And there's still some people there. It's five o'clock, one hour's left, and he says, come on, come on. And this is such a wonderful teaching. Because the man pays them all the same. And those who are working their human kingdoms get mad about it. And they say, listen, we've borne the heat of the day. We've been out here and you're paying these guys the same amount that you're paying us. What do you mean? Well, he had offended their sense of justice. Right? But the kingdom of God knows that justice will never do justice to justice. You've got to have something more. And justice. He did justice. He paid them what he promised. Kingdom of heaven works with love and mercy and takes care of justice too. The guys who couldn't get work until five o'clock, they had hungry babies at home. The kingdom is aware of that. And all the teachings about the kingdom. Jesus constantly teaching about the kingdom. And uh, uh, the kingdom rings in the ears of his closest disciples and they keep thinking, government, I wonder if I could be the secretary of state. Uh, uh, the chancellor of the exeter. Uh, Let's have Mama talk to Jesus about that. Right? See, that's those old human kingdoms coming back in. <laughs> and you know, we're still troubled by this. There are many people today who think the kingdom of God is the millennium. They think it's a literal human government. It's a government, all right. But it's not human. It's the one that destroys human governments. You go back and look at Daniel 2, and you see there the stone cut out without hands that rolls down out of the heavens and smashes the idol and crushes it, and human government, which is based upon individual human beings, always, always. Um, 
and um, people try to take advantage of it. I mean, you go around the world, you see what is the problem with human government. You don't have to go to Zimbabwe to find out. Stay close to home and you'll find that human government is troubled by individuals who are pushing their own government. You might even find a church somewhere in which that happens. You might, you know, if you look real hard. And that's why often in our churches you just have mad people. Because they're not deferring to God's government and his presence, see. Now Jesus comes into the world to make the kingdom of God available to everyone. That's, I mean, if you think about diversity, you haven't seen diversity until you get with Jesus. Then you learn what diversity really is. That was understood in the early church. Augustine even points it out and takes pride that, that in the church there is Everyone is welcomed and everyone is loved in the church. Jesus comes now in a lowly form. He does not go to seminary. He doesn't study with a rabbi. Very interesting. He breaks the mold. And in many respects, they say, oh, you don't do the right thing. I say, well, you know, you can't put new cloth on old britches. If you do, when you climb over the barbed wire fence, it'll catch on that new piece of cloth and it'll tear the old britches away. And the hole will be bigger than it was to start with. <laughs> Don't you just love Jesus <coughs> and the way he teaches? You put new wine in old wine bottles, the bottles can't expand and they'll burst. Right? You see, he's doing something new. And see, he walks among human beings. And uh, associates with disgusting people. What about that? Jan does such a wonderful job with her Ignatian treatments. And one she does is uh, in Luke, where Jesus is having a party with a bunch of Republicans and sinners, you know. And they're having a good time over there, and the Pharisees are standing over here, and guess what they're doing? They're grumbling. They're grumbling. That's what Pharisees do, is they grumble, 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 grumble. Right? That's why Paul wants us to get off of grumbling. Right? And Jesus comes among people, and when he says, repent for the kingdom of the heaven is at hand, what is he talking about? He's talking about him. Where was the kingdom at hand? In him. See. To be at hand meant it's right there. It didn't mean it's about to come. It's already here. Luke 17, people say, well, where's the kingdom of God? Where's the kingdom? Oh, there's a big racket going on over here. Maybe that's the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, oh, forget it, fellas. The kingdom of God does not come with observation. The kingdom of God is among you already. It's right here. Right here. God is here. See? God is here. Now, if you want to know God, count on it. That's how you know it. If you have trouble counting on it, look at Jesus. He'll help you. The kingdom of God is present in Jesus Christ. So he didn't seek authentication from any of the authorities. This wild man Baptist, the baptizer, didn't hang out at the temple. But he was the testimony of the Old Testament prophet who also walked in the kingdom of God. See? You get a religion 
And then you get priests. And you'd better find a few prophets. Because if you don't, the institution will seduce you. And it will have paid employees which do that. You better have someone coming out of the wilderness like Elijah. I want to start a society of Tishbites. <laughs> Elijah the Tishbite. We don't even know what a Tishbite was. You know? Where's Tish? See, Jesus walks among us. And then all kinds of people come to him. Matthew 11, 11. So important to understand that verse. It's John the Baptist is in the background. And John really had trouble understanding this also. He knew what to say, but he didn't know what he was saying. That's not a bad place to be in. I mean, I've been there a few times. <laughs> John the Baptist, thrown in prison, sends people to find, are you the one, Jesus? Because he too had thought in terms of a revival of the Davidic kingdom. And what David did was, he really beat up the enemies of Israel. And they had a few people in mind for him to beat up on. And, and you know, they were pretty sure he could do it. You know, if you, can, if you can take a little lunch from a boy and feed thousands of people with it, you could probably get elected president of the United States. Just think what a welfare program you could do. You wouldn't even have to tax people for it. You'd just stand there in the Oval Office and, okay, here's a basket, take it out. See? That's Jesus. That's the kingdom present in him. See, if you've got the power, you can create matter. You know how. And he knew how. Right? So Jesus comes among us, and he says now, Among those born of women, none is greater than John the Baptist. Matthew eleven eleven. 11. But he that is least in the kingdom of the heavens is greater than John the Baptist. Now let me ask you a question to see how you're doing with this. Is there anyone in the room here that is greater than John the Baptist? Hmm? Why are they greater? Because of the kingdom. And they are working with the kingdom in the way that John the Baptist himself didn't know how to do. You remember it was said, John did no miracle. They were comparing John to Jesus. And when Jesus sent his message back to John the Baptist in prison, he said, tell him this, the blind see, gospel is preached to the poor, blessed is he that's not offended in me. What was Jesus doing? He was telling John, here's what the kingdom really is. It's the action of God. And you can judge for yourself, John, whether or not I'm the one by looking at what I do. And this was a battle that Jesus fought out in his teachings. He asked the question once in a confrontation, what think you of Christ? Whose son is he? And then Jesus, who really knew the scripture, <laughs> quoted Psalm 110 to them, where David calls the Messiah Lord, and no Jewish man is going to do that to his son. And Jesus is pushing the old wine bags the old cloth away. So you see, the Messiah is not going to be a Jewish king. Do you understand what that's about? He's not going to be a Jewish king. He's not going to have a political reign. 
Now, you got folks today that are still expecting him to come back with an atomic cattle prod and straighten everybody out, you know, because they still think it's a political deal. Well, it has implications for that, but it's not political. In its nature, it's political in its effect. You know, it's funny how sometimes the perversions of truth catch some of the truth. And Marx was absolutely right about the withering away of the state. He was wrong about the problem, but right about the outcome. And actually, Marx knew the Bible, and he knew the prophecies, and probably understood Daniel too. Except the stone cut out without hands was not going to be the proletariat. It was going to be Jesus and his kingdom. So Jesus makes the kingdom available to everyone. Now it moves in. So here's what is the kingdom of God. Acts 1. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom unto Israel? blah de blah de blah de blah de blah Well, he didn't bother to scold them. He doesn't scold very much. He just says, well, you know, it's not for you to know. You're looking for position, but I'm going to give you power instead of position. Now, please understand about the kingdom of God. It is power without human position. You will receive power. See, human beings only think of power in terms of position. Give me the position and I'll get the power. The power you get will be human power. And it always is misguided, more or less. When you act in the power of God, it's right, because he's in charge. So Paul acted in the power of God. You remember he went to Cyprus and there was this guy out there trying to mislead the governor, and Paul finally said to him, you confused, misguided fellow, why do you always, why are you resisting the power of God? And he said, now something very interesting, the hand of the Lord will be on you, and you're going to go about for a while blind, a lot of interesting things in that. Paul knew someone else that that happened to. Do you remember? <laughs> he knew that by experience. He said, the hand of the Lord. He didn't say, my hand will be upon you. My hand is not safe. People often ask me when I talk about anger and getting rid of it, well, Jesus got angry and went into the temple and whacked a bunch of people around and did violence to their business and all of that. Well, you know, I can trust Jesus with things I would never trust myself. When he did it, it wasn't just his hand. If I did it, very likely I would get into it too much. And it would turn out to be just my hand, the hand of the Lord. So Acts 1, Jesus, after his resurrection, came back. And what did he talk with them about? That their sins would be forgiven and they'd go to heaven when they die. No, verse 3, check it. He talked to them about the kingdom of God. God's reign. And now he's getting ready to break out of the Jewish mold. He was very careful to stay mostly within that because here were people who were already prepared well enough that he could work with them and then they could go to the world. They will need power because they have nothing else. They didn't have any equipment. They didn't know what they were doing. Jesus standing here and saying, well, now it's time. I've been given authority over everything in heaven and earth, power, kingdom. Go ye therefore to all kinds of people, to all nations. Nations, the standard meaning is Gentile. Go to all nations. Make disciples. Make disciples. I'll be with you. 
surround them in Trinitarian reality, and teach them to do everything I said. Teachers of the nations. That's what you're called to do, is to be a teacher of the nations. Now we're ready to go. And then there he goes. And the, the apostles and the leaders are kind of walking backward into the future. They have no idea what's going on. You know, they're hiding in that upper room and then they hear something and, and they remember Jesus said he was going to send the promise of the Father. What's happening here? They heard a sound from uh, where? Who said heaven? They heard a sound from heaven. Now, where, do, where did they last see Jesus going? Heaven. He's so careful to make the connections because he knows we're all a bunch of boobies and we need to have the connection made so that you, you might ask yourself, why didn't he just disappear? He could have done that, but he wanted them to know where he went. Where did he go? Into heaven. What's the next move? A sound from heaven. And power begins to manifest itself. And it turns out there are Jews from all over the known world right there to observe this phenomena and the explosion begins, and the promise of God to Abraham that he would be a blessing to all the families and nations of the earth takes off like a rocket. That's the kingdom. The kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. And later on, for example, talking to the Romans in Romans 14, 17, He's talking to people who are having a church fight about what they're going to eat. Ah, give us a break, folks. Jesus got more criticism for dietary laws and rituals and, and Sabbath than anything else. <laughs> and you just think, oh, God help us. What are we thinking about? What are we thinking about? God help us. And Jesus says, look, the kingdom of God is not in eating and drinking, but in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's church, see? Well, I've run out of time to talk about this, but I hope you get the message. The kingdom of the heavens is at hand right there where you are. When Paul said to the Greeks in Athens, in him we live and move and have our being, he was doing nothing but taking the message of Jesus and putting it in the world for everyone. See? And that's what we do today is we bring that and we bring it in ourselves. Jesus sent his disciples out to preach the gospel and told them, if people listen to you, good. If they don't, tell them uh, that wipe off the dust from their feet and it's going to <coughs> constitute a recording that will be played on the Day of Judgment. And uh, uh, tell them, none nevertheless, the kingdom of God came close to you. Right? How did it do? In those people. You're a person of the kingdom. God is acting with you. The kingdom of God is moving with you. Well, I must stop now and let's, oh, let me have another minute. No, let me have another minute. Come on. Because, you know, this really all comes out in the Lord's Prayer, as we call it. And the old uh, version we're all familiar with and seeing is wonderful. But sometimes the words don't say much, and so I've reformulated it here, and this is printed in the, in the Divine Conspiracy and so on. But once you get the idea of the kingdom, then this is how you pray. Dear Father, always near us. Our Father who art in heaven, heaven is near. Not far away. Not much later. Dear Father, always near us. 
May your name be treasured and loved. May your rule be completed in us. May your will be done here on earth in just the way it's done in heaven. Give us today the things we need for today. And forgive our sins and impositions on you as we are forgiving all who in any way offend us. Please don't put us through trials, but deliver us from everything bad. Because you're the one in charge, and you have all the power, and the glory, too, is all yours forever. And now, how do you say amen? Well, I suggest, which is just the way we want it. Now, if you get into the spirit of it, you can also substitute for amen, whoopee. <laughs> you try it. You try it now. Be sure and do that. You want to do it in the solitude of your cell at first, but you might even be able to do it in public after a while. Okay. Gary? Questions? Keith? Keith? Uh, You've been talking a lot about power. Yes. Every time I hear it, I it seems to be in a different context. And I've had thoughts like, well, is it transformation? Is it influence? Is it miracles? Is it, uh, what was the other thing, results? Can you define power? As power is the capacity power? to affect change. <coughs> Excuse me. That's the nature of power. It, uh, the, Paul will use the word energy also. And Paul, once you understand this, you'll see Paul is absolutely power mad. And he's always referring back to the power that raised Christ from the dead. And he's saying, that's, what you're, what's, that's what's going on in you. Right? Uh, Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 for he's able to do exceedingly abundantly all above all things you can ask or think by the power that is manifested in the resurrection of Christ from the dead. So that's power. Now, uh, human beings, when they start exercising power, will invariably turn to force. And not all power is force. You know what it is to force something, right? And, uh, but you learn in life that some things that can be pushed can't be pulled, and some things that can be pulled can't be pushed, right? And so uh, you learn not to always push. Pulling is more like influence. Now, God has all power, and so he could push anything he wanted to push, but he doesn't want to, because he knows that what he is aiming for in human character and the outcome of human history is something you can't push. You have to pull it. And so he pulls, and he woos, and he influences and he waits and then he puts us in a position and gives us this thing called prayer where we get to do the same thing. See, a lot of people try to put prayer in the category of pushing. It's not in pushing, it's pulling. And it's in, it doesn't work like we want it to work sometimes. So we have to rethink this whole issue of how persons and kingdoms work in order to understand prayer. But that's the basic idea. Power is the capacity to change things. And uh, then there's different kinds of power. Yes? Would you say a little more about your sentence, the people of Christ have always accomplished the most when they have had the least? <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, it's historically true. Right? Think of the church in China and what has happened there. But it's true with the guys standing there listening to Jesus say, go to all nations. And, and you know, they were a cynical bunch still. 
right there. And you can just hear a couple of them leaning over. One looks at the other and says, yes, in the light of our recent successes in Jerusalem, <laughs> we're ready to take on the world. <laughs> These guys are realistic, you know. And uh, now, why is that? It's because when you don't have anything else to count on, you wind up counting on God. And uh, someone was talking about to me yesterday, I think, about being in a, some other countries where they were very poor and remarking on how happy they were. And there is an element here of when you don't have a lot to do, you know how to live with people. You learn how to live with people and you take joy. And you watch that in families. And uh, for example, you watch how older, sit older brothers and sisters take care of the little ones and learn to love them. And the little ones love them. You get a different family structure than one where every kid has his own room, maybe his own bathroom, his own iPod, his own TV, his own, so they go in the room. And just walking around on the streets, being ignored by multitudes of people who are talking to someone about nothing important far away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't you feel that? Yeah, I mean, used to when we saw people standing around talking to themselves, we thought they were unbalanced, but now they're just talking on their telephone. So uh, it's, it's a matter of what you've got to trust, Jan, in the bottom line, that's it. What have you got to trust? And when uh, religious institutions tend to create something to trust other than God. Now that is what happened in Israel. In the book of Judges, they just had to wait for God to raise up some person to deliver them. And they finally said to Samuel, the last of the judges, we want a king. That is, we want someone we don't have to wait until you raise them up to take care of us. And now that's the part of a large story. Of, I mean, it's, it didn't take God by surprise, of course. He knew it was basically wrong, but he said, no, okay, give them a king. Tell them what the king is going to do to them. There's going to be taxes. He'll come and take your daughters for his household, and he'll take your sons for his army, and so forth and so, so on. See, so. But that was important, because actually they had to learn about the kingdom of God, and they had to learn that the kingdom of God was not associated with a place and an institution. And so God allows the institution of Israel to grow up, build a big, wonderful city, amazing temple and all of that, and then wacko. It's gone. And you've got other kings hauling all the goods off, punching the eyes out of the king, first killing his sons in front of him so he would see that and then punching his eyes out and leading him off to Babylon. Yeah. Now, what's the effect of that? The effect of that is they discover that God is in Babylon. That's what they learn. The exile, as we call it, is a lesson in the reality of the kingdom. And it is in exile that they begin to discover, as Daniel says over and over, there is a God in heaven. And they had thought gods were local. See, that discussion with the Samaritan woman that I talked about yesterday, that's on a, on, that's on a par with... 1 Kings 20, where you have the Aramaeans saying, well, they beat us up today, but you know, their God uh, is uh, localized where we beat up. Let's move the battle over here. Their God is a God of the hills. Let's get them down here in the plains. And their God won't do anything to help them. See, that, that kind of perversion of God, that has to be worked out. Now they build a big temple, build a big city, and they say, wow, aren't we great? And they were. But they were also blind. And the God which enabled them to build a big city, they forsook. 
and God wipes out the city and send them, sends them as slaves to Babylon and Nineveh and places like that so that they can learn that God is still there. That is the basic message. The kingdom of God is at hand. Where is the kingdom of God? Anywhere you are. If you can just get your kingdom out of the way, then he'll move in. If you're in charge, he'll let you. Rots a ruck. So now that's crucial. God, the people of God has always been at their strongest when they had the least. Because they're trusting the right thing. Other questions? Way back here. Yes, sir. Um, given Jan's question, this might be more of a, of a statement, but um, I think it was in uh, Richard Foster's book, uh, The Challenge of the Disciplined Life, Dealing with Money, Sex, and Power. Uh, he said, that obviously, the number one teaching of Jesus was the kingdom, but the second most uh, talked about topic was money. Uh, and, and how should we approach uh, a practical uh, curriculum for Christ-likeness in dealing with the issue of money with the body of Christ and how uh, so many times people have to work to support a lifestyle and they really don't have the uh, option to uh, take care of widows and orphans uh, because of, of propping up their own, I guess you could say, kingdom that they have control over with money. You got it right. I can't improve on that. There's nothing wrong with money. Just don't trust it. Don't love it. Use it. Money is real kingdom stuff. When you understand that your kingdom is a matter of the range of your effective will, then you realize money extends the range of your effective will. Now the question is, are you going to use it for yourself or are you going to use it for the glory of God? And if you, haven't, if you don't know the reality of the kingdom, you'll probably use it for yourself to secure yourself. Like when you enter the kingdom, if you do it in an orderly, informed way, the first two steps are prayer and giving. That's how you engage the kingdom, is in prayer and giving. And giving is kingdom life. That's why the poor widow who put in two mites gave more than all the rest of them. And you know, you have to watch Jesus' words because if you don't, you have to just think, well, more pretty words. Isn't he sweet? He said the little lady gave more than, of course, well, you know, must be something there, but it couldn't possibly be true. No, it was true. Because that gift was done with the action of God. She did give more than all the others. See? That was kingdom work. You give a lot of money. If it's not kingdom work, forget it. It will probably not have much good effect. Giving and prayer are the first two orderly ways that you begin to engage the kingdom. Yeah, I'd like to uh, uh, look at uh, your talk from the perspective of education, particularly theological education. And one of my jobs is to help professors do a better job of teaching. That's in my job description. And traditionally, we, we tell them that they need to write objectives based on Benjamin Bloom, cognitive, affective, and mm -hmm. not very many psychomotor objectives in that category. But when you were talking about um, repentance, um, it sounded an awful lot like a secular term we use called metacognition. Mm -hmm. which means, it is. Which means to think about your thinking. That's, but that's exactly what it to is. To analyze your learning style yeah. so you can be a better learner. Very good. But I wonder if um, to move beyond just uh, having people trying to get over seminary experiences and not growing but dying in the process, if, if we need to rethink how we teach. And like what we've heard about not just learning what the rabbi knows but becoming who the rabbi is. And how do we how do we do that? Um, one example I, I look at is Wayne Grudem and his systematic theology, 
which is quite unusual. After his presentation on each chapter, he has old hymns, like we sang, and memory mm -hmm. verses. Mm -hmm. But um, I just well, want... Wayne, Wayne is a person who has had a different experience. Right, <laughs> right. So it's just, I'm wondering, you know, and all of us here in one capacity or another are teachers. Mm -hmm. And if we ought not to think about that in terms of our lesson planning, in terms of getting people to make a commitment, uh, and a personal commitment, and to reflect on what's going on, rather than just collect more information. Well, uh, first of all, the idea of having objectives is really fundamental stuff. The question is, what are the objectives? And um, there's the further question, are the real objectives the ones I stated? Now, a person who is teaching in an institution is under a lot of pressure from the institution, often not said, but just present in the lives of those around them. And for example, in most of our uh, schools, the real objective is to turn people into scholars like themselves. And uh, so something called scholarship as defined by the profession uh, winds up setting the real objectives. And if you, don't have, if you don't have those objectives, at least explicitly stated, then you'll be in trouble with your crowd. Uh, so now then, the individual has to decide what am I really trying to accomplish with my students? What am I really trying to accomplish with my students? Am I trying to make someone in my image? Am I most highly complimented when one of my students goes off to study to become like me? Or do I have in view um, Routine obedience to Christ. Now you know if you were if you're talking about a seminary, you might think that would be the objective. It could be. It would certainly stir things up if that were explicitly stated, and uh, very likely your seminary would be in trouble with the accrediting association, and so you'd have to know what you're doing and be ready to do that in cooperation with God. So uh, now you need to be able to put into consideration with your work everything that matters. So obviously you're a human being, you live in a world and there are a lot of different factors, but when it comes to a class uh, then you should have some clear objective and suit your method to that. The question is, what is the objective? Now, you will find many churches that will spend two years and a half trying to work out a mission statement. And you might say, well, why don't you just try Matthew 28, 19 through 20? That that actually is the best church growth program that has ever hit the face of the earth. But it goes through making disciples. Now suppose a, an educational institution had that as its objective. They wanted their students to come out as disciples making disciples and then leading the disciples on. Sounds good to me. So you, you're raising a very challenging issue, of course. I don't mean to be light about it because in many ways this is the problem. If you have churches and institutions that are turning out Christians who are not disciples, that's just pretty much the end of the world as far as Christ's purposes are concerned. Any other question? We have yes. one back there, and then the next one is up here. Someone walked away yesterday with a question. Um, 
Would you say that this is a redefining of the gospel? Or would you say this is an expansion of it? When we talk about, um, you know, that the gospel isn't just forgiveness of sins. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the sometimes what's left out of the dialogue is where the place of the cross is. Mm -hmm. Of justification, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So that was a question uh, kind of left open-ended. Imputed righteousness and... And, and we would, I think, definitely agree that's been the over focus, and we've limited it to that. Mm -hmm. But in this larger discussion, where does that still fit in? Where the cross fits in, and well, what and what happened at the cross? Oh, okay. Uh, well, uh, a lot of different ways it does fit in. Um, it is a way of putting the death and life of Christ on the earth map. Um, you have to think about that because the purpose now is to reach all nations with the gospel that God has a kingdom and that he receives people uh, in that kingdom and gives them life. Uh, that is primarily, and if someone wants to say all together, then I just want to hear them explain that, and that may be right. I, in fact, I believe all together, um, if you give one time to explain it. But it is mainly through Christ, the person. How is Christ to be presented? That's, that's the problem. If you're God, and you want to send your son, and you want him to be preached to all nations, how are you going to do it? That's the problem that the cross solves. Mm -hmm. Now, something was going on between the Son and the Father at the cross. Right? Now the question is what? And that's where the theory that what was going on was God had a big beating in him and he got it out at the cross. And because of that, you don't have to take a beating. Right? Now, I understand that some people equate that with the penal substitutionary death of Christ. That's a bad mistake. That's just one way of understanding it. You cannot eliminate the substitutionary death of Christ. He died for us. Now, what your theory is, okay, you can worry about that. But when you're thinking about atonement or resurrection or any of these big issues, you want to always distinguish the fact from the theory. And the tendency is to identify the fact with some theory, reject the theory, and throw out the fact. Keep the fact and let the theories chatter about. Don't worry about too, too much about them unless they wind up throwing out the fact which is exactly what happens in many cases. Christ died for our sins. That's it. And it had some effect on God's dealing with us. I have no doubt about it. But I couldn't tell you what that was because I'm not a, a privileged person with reference to the secrets of the Trinity. I do believe for sure that it meant now God was going to deal with people in a different way because of the cross. But here's another function of the cross. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ whereby the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. The cross is for me. The cross of the individual is not their flat tire or their unpleasant relative. That is not the cross. The cross is self-denial. The cross is joining Christ on the cross of self-denial. I will do the will of God. That's the cross. Even Calvin gets this a little confused in his writings. Because sometimes he'll talk and start a long trend. Is, your, your cross is your troubles. No, no, your, your cross is what sets you free from your troubles. Mm -hmm. yeah. You take the cross 
and your troubles will be something that you can then count it all joy, brothers and sisters, when you fall into all kinds of troubles. Those aren't crosses. Those are opportunities to know the kingdom. That's what a trouble is. If you have the cross on you, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And that I, I now live by the faith of, not in, read the Greek, again, these prepositions. The life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Right? So now then, um, I quoted or misquoted 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 15 to the other day, so I'd better get it right. Therefore, uh, he died for us all. This is 2 Corinthians 5, 15. He died for us all that they who live should no longer live for themselves. That's the cross. But for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no man according to the flesh, even though we've known Christ after the flesh. We don't know him anymore. That's vessel. What is the reality? It is the reality of the risen Christ and me risen with him. You go to the resurrection for yourself through the cross, just like Jesus did. See, for the way most people think about the work of the cross, it has no bearing on the spiritual life. And if it doesn't, then you need another theory. Because the cross is central to our life. Because it takes us off of the vessel and puts us onto the treasure. I love George Fox's old way of putting it. His work was taking people off of men and putting them onto Christ. See, And that's the absolute essential thing, and that's what the cross does. Because on the cross, among other things, you saw the best people in human terms kill the best man by judicial murder. They murdered him through the judicial system. An innocent man, and everyone involved knew he was innocent. But you had a bunch that were intent on their own kingdoms, and they knew that he sounded the death knell of human kingdoms. And Caiaphas, you remember, said, don't you know that one man must die for the people? We've got to get rid of this guy because they're going to come and they're going to take our job away. Wow, what exalted motives. And it, the scriptures even tell us, Pilate knew that they delivered him for envy. And then Pilate, that old rascal, cooperated with him. So the cross is central, absolutely central, to the redemptive work of Christ on earth. And it affects how God deals with the world. That's the fact. He died for us. That's a fact. Just don't let your theories make God look little. And if you aren't careful with what, the way some people understand the atonement, you get a God who never forgives. He just gets paid off. And actually by a little bookkeeping that looks very suspicious. You know, maybe Enron could have learned something from that. So you don't, you don't want God to turn out looking bad. Don't believe anything bad about God. Believe everything good. And one is that, as I talked yesterday, his righteousness does not consist in seeing to it that everyone is appropriately punched. That is not the righteousness of God. That is not what the cross revealed. The cross revealed a God whose righteousness is his love. And that comes grace. Grace. 